Welcome to Les Voix de la Photo. My name is Marine Lefort and I'm speaking to photography professionals every two weeks to discover their journeys, successes and sometimes setbacks and give us uh, some advice along the way. I'm French, but I live in Japan, and during my expatriation, I will regularly interview professionals who work in the Japanese photography industry. Most of the interviews will be in French, but some interviews will be in English like this one. I hope you will enjoy this episode. Bonjour à toutes et à tous, je suis Marine Lefort et vous écoutez Les Voix de la Photo. Hello everybody, I'm Marine Lefort and you are listening to Les Voix de la Photo. Today, this episode will be uh, in English because my guest is an uh, English uh, speaker. So just to let you know, uh, I think I will do some other episode in English because, as you know, I'm currently living in Japan and I'm very interested in Japanese photography and its industry. So I want to give the voice to people who really know the Japanese photography uh, industry. And most of them do not speak French. So I hope you will like this, this first uh, episode uh, in English. So today, I'm with uh, Ivan uh, Vartanian. Hello, Ivan. Hello. Thank you for having me. Ivan Vartanian, you are a publisher specializing in uh, Japanese photography, and you just uh, released a book about Japanese uh, photography magazine from the 1880 to 1980. So to start this episode, uh, could you present yourself and do you can explain to me where your passion from photography uh, is coming from? Wow, that's a <laughs> big question. Uh, as a self-introduction, I've been in Japan for about half my life, and I came here after I was working at Aperture in New York, a publisher of photo books. And it was through them, through that experience that I met with a, I got to know a Japanese publisher who'd offered me a job in Tokyo to work in the publishing industry here simply because they thought I was interested in Japanese photography, which I was at the time. So I was in my 20s and I thought, why not? You know, one year in Tokyo could be a wonderful adventure. And I accepted the job through an interpreter. I had no command of, well, not uh, even understanding of the Japanese language. And I'd never been to Japan before, and I didn't know anything about publishing, really. I was an assistant to Aperture's uh, a senior editor. So it was very much being thrown into uh, the deep end of a pool with having no idea what I was doing, just as well, because I would have been completely intimidated by meeting all these legendary photographers and figures in the uh, photography world here. And that was my introduction to publishing and photography and being an editor in Japan. And I, after that, was making books on art and design. And uh, after a few years, I then came back to photography and saw that there were many people who were making amazing photography books, photo books, monographs, or uh, these kinds of publications that were just beautiful. I would go to the bookstore and I would cry that there's no way I could make something so fantastic. So I wondered what could I do that was a contribution to the conversation that was specific to me. And that's how I started making books that were about the history of Japanese photography. And just before that, uh, what did you study in, uh, and uh, where, do, where do you come from? Like uh, your family, where oh, do you come from? I see. And, uh, what did you study and um, uh, how, do you, uh, from, how do you start at the uh, aperture? Like uh, oh, do you I know see. someone or do you... Oh wow, the very beginning. <laughs> uh, my, I'm from New York originally and my family uh, were Armenians. My father's family was from Marseille, Armenian from Marseille. And my mother's family is from uh, Iran, uh, Armenian, but from Iran. And they met in New York, and that's where I was born. And I went to NYU, and I studied biochemistry. And then I did realize I did not want to become a doctor. 
And I looked for an internship right after graduation, and Aperture had this work scholar program that I applied to to study whatever it was supposed to be. And then that's where I met some really amazing people uh, who, I guess you could say, changed my life, like people like Melissa Harris and the publisher of Aperture, Michael E. Hoffman, and Wendy Byrne, who was uh, a designer at Aperture. These people opened my eyes to what it could mean to interact with art and go beyond photography. It wasn't about the mechanics or the gear or uh, the, uh, the, the those kinds of details. It was about uh, photographers or uh, the artistic intent behind the photography. And that was very eye-opening to me. And it was at Aperture that I first encountered Japanese photography, uh, Moriyama Daido. It was, if I think of it now, it's a very, very bizarre story. He sent a copy of one of his books to Aperture that was published by Hysteric Glamour. And uh, I was there when they opened the box and they were looking through it and it was this very bizarre book. They had no page numbers and there was no white around the images and it was very big and the paper was very glossy. So you just touch it and it would get damaged. And it was like a an alien had taken photographs and sent it to Earth. It was so bizarre. The horizon line was at an angle and everything was so much information and everything was just a jumble of complete uh well compared to aperture's books chaos at aperture our job was to make books that were as close as possible to the exhibition print that the photographer would supply so our job was to make a copy of an original print. So in comparison, now when I look back on it, when I was at Aperture, the photo book was only ever like uh, uh, a catalog of what the artist had made. Whereas what Daida Moriyama had sent to Aperture, in an, even in the experience of the book, it was an experience in and of itself. So that was very an eye-opening experience to me. And then years later, maybe 15 years later, I remember Dido Moriyama was like, yeah, I sent a book to Aperture and they never sent it back. And where, what happened to that book? And I, he was bothered <laughs> by that experience. But I had to say, well, at least something good came of it. It was one of the reasons why I came to Japan. Uh, so that is kind of very quickly my background and how I wound up uh, coming to Japan. So just to 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 continue what you said before, so you you start to work for a um, Japanese uh, publisher. Um, uh, it was for uh, it was um, it was already working with uh, Aperture of uh, this uh, uh, publisher. Oh, good question. Aperture was publishing the American or English language version of a photo book that the Japanese publisher, Korinsha, was publishing. So Korinsha reached out to Aperture to have them do the co-publication of a book by Kon Michiko. And uh, they said, Aperture said yes, this very uh, surreal, fantastical uh, body of work. Uh, she worked with uh, a lot of animal parts, like chickens and fish and costume, uh, vestiment, as I guess you would say. And uh, it's very lyrical and uh, bizarre. And Aperture, since they knew I was kind of interested in Japanese photography, they said, why don't you take care of this project on the Aperture side and see it gets through the steps that it needs to get through. And I should point out that uh, why one of the reasons why I got into Japanese photography was uh, Leslie Martin, 
who is now the uh, editorial director of Aperture, and she had been in Aperture. Uh, she had been at. Uh, she had been living in Japan for years before she came to Aperture, and I met her at Aperture as a fellow intern, which was crazy because she. Uh, she looked like she was running the place. She knew what she was doing and everything. She was on top of it and walked very quickly in the in the corridors of Aperture. And she rode a motorcycle and had blue hair and tattoos. And I was like, who are these people? <laughs> like, I am from New York, and I thought New York was this amazing, very cosmopolitan center of the world. But I very quickly at Aperture realized that there were all these worlds that I hadn't even considered. And that was extremely exciting, like the art world and working with artists and photography and making books. And then Japan being this extremely, at the time for me, exotic other world and being going to a place that was completely different from anything that I knew uh, in New York and speaking a language or exposing myself to a language that I uh, was totally unfamiliar with was very intoxicating, especially for someone who was looking for an adventure uh, in my 20s. So when I was at Aperture, I was very drawn to things that were non-American, uh, uh, like the Mexican photographer uh, Graciela Iturbite or uh, Manuel Alvarez Bravo, or uh, the Japanese uh, photographers. So, um, yeah, I think if other people had been there, I could be sitting in Mexico now, <laughs> years later. But here I am in, uh, in Japan. So it was through that co-publication, that book, uh, that I met the Karinsha, the publisher of Karinsha. And he, through an interpreter, offered me a job in front of my former boss, and uh, it was crazy. It's, uh, if I think about it now, like how lucky I was to someone thought this kid was worth offering a job to transplant from New York to Tokyo. I was, and also Aperture was extremely supportive and very encouraging. It, it, it's, I, if I think about it now, it's just uh, unbelievable how the generosity, I'm getting very emotional, uh, the generosity of people, yeah. What were the other, the other steps, uh, the other steps uh, before um, thinking about creating your own publishing company, mm. like, uh, like, mm -hmm. uh, from uh, the, 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 your, the, the first uh, job uh, in in Japan, from a Japanese uh, company, and f from thinking to have your own mm -hmm. uh, publishing um, uh, company, uh, what is between? <laughs> well, there was a direct overlap. So, Karinsha uh, offered me a job. I came to Japan. And then once I got here, uh, certain things became very clear. And the publishing industry in Japan was going through a very, very difficult period. And many publishers that were established for a long time uh, went bankrupt. Because of the bubble? This is a long time. It was already 10 years after the bubble when I came to Japan. It was just that the publishing industry, media, was going through a very painful transition period. Uh, so magazines were not... Uh, selling as well. Books were not selling as well. Bookstores were having a difficulty uh, 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 turning over inventory. There was a lot of competition in the uh, market from the digital world. I mean, the internet and uh, uh, video games and video game consoles, the whole idea of what it means to have entertainment or having a hobby uh, was shifting quite dramatically uh, at that time. So Media in and of itself, print media, was uh, very disrupted, including the camera industry, which transferred was going from analog to digital. So not just in the publishing world, but in a, a lot of different sectors, you had a, a painful transition period. And one of the manifestations of that transition were companies disappearing. And one of the companies that went bankrupt was Corinthia. So a little less than two years after I was 
at the company, they went bankrupt. This is not to say this is not to say that it was only an industry related issue. I think that there was some <laughs> mismanagement too, and the publisher uh, had very romantic ideas and. You know, one of them being, let's hire this white kid to come to Japan. So before Corinthia went bankrupt, I was developing book projects for them. And once they went bankrupt, I had these book projects that I had started, but there was no publisher anymore. And DAP, who's a very important distributor of independent publishers in New York, uh, said to me, Ivan, you can complete the book and we will buy the book from you as a book packager. And I went, what does a book packager mean? You mean put it in a box? I, I So naive, so clueless. So that was really the start where I had projects that I had developed, started at Corinthia that I then uh, did under my own name. One of them was a book on Andy Warhol and another book was a uh big book I did on Egon Schiele, Drawings and Watercolors. Uh, the Egon Schiele book uh, I published uh, with Thames and Hudson, uh, uh, which is a very important uh, English language publisher of art books. And I also published the Japanese version with uh, Shinchosha and the French edition with Editorial Hazan, who died uh, a few years ago. So that was the transition where p people, again, Shinchosha, which is this major publisher, Thames and Hudson, this major publisher, and editor Hazan, uh, not a big publisher, but uh, these people were like, hey, this 20-something kid who has these books, let's give him all this money to <laughs> buy the books. And I made the book, and... Uh, it, that it was this an, an insane experience where everything was in my name and the printer too. Like the, if I think about it now, like the the printer with I had zero credit. This random person off the street, pretty much, is asking this printer in China, please print, you know, ten fifteen thousand copies, and the invoice. You could buy a house with the invoice, and I have no one. No backing, no collateral, just my name, just me. And the, and the printer said, okay, he accepted the job from this kid. It's unbelievable. And so when the invoice came in, I remember, I'll never forget it to this day, it, the invoice was maybe a centimeter thick of how many things came. And the number... The amount was so big on the invoice that the one and only time in my life I had tunnel vision. So everything else, I don't know if you know this expression. No. Tunnel vision is where everything else becomes black and then your vision mm. becomes very, and the world becomes this very thing at the end of a dark tunnel. And my ears started ringing and my heart started beating. I couldn't believe the amount of money that I had to pay the printer. It was like... Uh, insanity but I paid the printer because uh, I had these reputable clients Thames and Hudson and Shinchosha and, and Hazan and they paid me and I paid the printer and uh, it took me I think two and a half three years to make that first book and this thing that was a idea in my head uh, became a reality after a few years and that was extremely Exciting and terrifying at the same time because I realized that the ideas that I had over time became real. So that meant the good ideas, also the bad ideas, too. Could you explain to me, like, how do you create a book, like, from the idea in your in your mind uh, uh, until the distribution of the. Like uh, and how uh, the, this, uh, the different uh, steps have evolved uh, since the first book you did and and uh, now. Mm. Mm. 
So maybe it's different for each book, but but maybe you have like uh, at least the main uh, because I think it's really interesting uh, f uh, for the people who, who don't really know like how a, a book uh, is created. So I think it's really interesting to have your own. Um, yeah, your. Uh -huh. So with the books that I make, they're they're very different from a monograph, which is one photographer's or one artist's work, uh, and they're different from portfolio books where you have maybe ten artists and each artist has you know ten pages or something. So the books that I have made, beginning with uh, the Warhol or the Egon Schiele was to tell some kind of story that, or some kind of development in the book. With the Egon Schiele book, what's remarkable about him is that he died at 27, but in a very short period of time, he went from a very typical uh, art academy student to this amazing expressionist artist. So... In the book, we do year-by-year -year evolution of his technique and what happened in his life and artistically how he developed. And so that was actually a very simple way to create the book because every year there was a very dramatic change. You know, someone in their 20s, every year has a, a lot of development. So with him and that book, it was very... Uh, it, it came together quite naturally to organize work from each year and discuss the work and its development. And Did you that, work with a historian? Yes, historian? Uh, uh, Jane Collier in New York, who is one of the most important dealers of Egon Schiele's work. She's the uh, granddaughter of one of uh, Egon Schiele's first uh, dealers in America. And she's a very gifted writer, too. And uh, that approach of uh, trying to use the book to uh, show something that wouldn't be visible otherwise is the basic my basic approach so um, in the 2027 I made a book uh, 22, 2007 2009 I made a book on Japanese photo books of the 1960s and 70s. And that was uh, showing the importance of the photo book in Japanese photography. At the time, the photo book as a thing, as an idea, wasn't really, a, it was only just people were becoming aware of it. Martin Parr and Jerry, Jeffrey Badger, had done their three volume book with Feiden. That was the history of the photo book. And that really, Martin's work with that book really opened people's eyes about what photography could be beyond just a image or a print. And there was a whole other conversation that happened. And so at the time, what was happening is that uh, the way in which we defined what photography is was starting to go through a process of opening up. Up until that time, uh, the photography discourse was quite uh, restrictive, and there were very very clear-cut clear ideas of what is a photograph and what isn't, and how to show a photograph, how to engage with a photograph, how it's reproduced. But in the 2000s, it, uh, beginning with the photo book, um, how people thought about photography uh changed. And another thing that uh, just a few years after that, vernacular photography also became a new idea that a photographer could appropriate, could use. He didn't have to be the one or she didn't have to be the one who was had their finger on the shutter release. The photograph could come from any source. It was the, the, the photographic act became much more diffuse. So it could be a found photo, it could be a photo book, it could be a text, it could be an installation. So uh, this was quite favorable to Japanese photography because it was, uh, up until then, Japanese photography had to fit into the pre-established categories that were made by the establishment. 
uh, and that was putting non-Western, non-American photography at a disadvantage. So part of my attitude is to look at those aspects of Japanese photography uh, that are uh, specific to the, the field. So that's why I made a book on writings of Japanese photographers because they write so much. And now I made this book on uh, photography magazines because uh, it is a very important part of the photography culture here. It's the, well, up until the 1980s, it was the culture of photography in Japan. So the approach is begins with what is the contribution that you're making to the larger discussion and looking at what's what is the trajectory of the conversation now in the world of photography or the world of art and what is needed in that and then how i in particular can do something that only i can do and so that is the basic attitude that's the basic uh approach when conceptualizing a book and looking for things to uh, make a book about what doesn't exist what needs and what do I feel needs to exist and what can I do uh, that uh, can uh, address that issue so all the books that I make are with with photography are about trying to uh, expand the discourse of photography in general by showcasing Japanese photography because I think it's still so different from uh, a Western lineage of photography. So that's the kind of uh, long answer. I don't know. I don't know how I can summarize it in something short. But. And how long, uh, for instance, how long um, uh, did, it, did it take for the last one? How long, uh, oh, I'm almost embarrassed to say how long it took, but like no, but many, I, many years. Yes, it mm. took uh, six years, and if you think about it as a sister publication to the photo book, uh, Japanese photo books of the 60s and 70s that Aperture published in 2009, uh, it's been over over 10 years that I have been working on this subject, and they're they're quite connected. But uh, it took about six years, and then, yeah, uh, the real concentration took maybe four years, and nonstop work was maybe three years. Uh, however, the, the book was made not by me alone. It was made by someone who I consider my professor, Kaneko Ryuichi, and he has been involved with the subject for 50 years. And the book... The magazine book is an expression of his engagement with photography for decades. So in a sense, it represents decades of wisdom and engagement. And um, yeah. And the book is uh, in English? The book is in English. And uh, there will be a Japanese that I published under my own imprint, Goliga. And there will be a Japanese language edition published by Hei Bonsha, which will be released later this year. We're working on that now. I would love to make a French language version of the book. I would love to. And it, it's, it is part of my mission to uh, make the, the research uh, and material accessible to a broad audience. Uh, the translation costs are astronomical so i have to i haven't come up with a solution yet of how to uh, justify the risk uh, with uh, the expense of making a french edition but the market in france is quite small and the french audience is very comfortable to read a certain amount uh, in english and so maybe the french audience is comfortable reading Uh, buying the English language uh, edition only. So that's still a question that I am looking at. But if I think about future books that I'm doing, it could be a good thing to 
begin with a French translation of this magazine book, and that will establish uh, an audience for the the new books I'm making now, which are almost all text. And where where can we find the the books? The book is uh, available through my website, and it will soon be available in Amazon France, and it will also be available in Amazon US, and for certain bookstores, uh, it will be available uh, throughout Europe and the States. These are photography specialist uh, bookstores, even though, you know, we almost make no money off <laughs> books that are sold in bookstores. It's it's important to have the books at a place where people want to have that conversation. What are the evolution you have seen in the publishing industry uh, since the last uh, 20 years? Do you have like, is there are some new elements or some, what are the challenges, uh, the challenges uh, for the publishing uh, industry? Mm, that's a big question. And I... I'm, I'm only going to answer part of the question because it's too difficult of a question to answer. So the publishing industry was a bloodbath of difficulty in the, two, in, the, in the 2000s. It was very difficult to publish anything. And I used to go to the Frankfurt Book Fair every year. And then I stopped and then I started going again. That book fair is the biggest industry fair uh, every year for publishing in October. And when I first got, started going 25 years ago, it was impossible to get a hotel room. It was impossible to find some place to eat because everyone, there were long lines everywhere. There were so many people and everyone was going crazy. It was so busy. Ten, year, ten years later, It was much fewer people. And then recently I went. One of the halls that was always full of people was empty, literally. And in other halls, people were playing Frisbee because it was just so empty. So the publishing industry has sh shrank considerably if you, you look at that metric. Then recently, the publishing industry expanded more and There was, uh, and that's thanks to online, uh, online publishing and online exchange of information, online media. It's easier to connect with an audience and easier to find like-minded people with similar interests. And a few years ago, well, uh, because of Corona, uh, online shopping exploded. And now a trend that was there To begin with, became much more pronounced and evolved very much quicker than it would have otherwise. And people are much more comfortable to buy books online now and ebooks and audiobooks. So, what has happened in the last few years because of uh, Corona and because of extremely sophisticated logistics, including Amazon and Now, Walmart in the United States has is competing with logistics, uh, Amazon type of logistics, uh, or Barnes and Noble trying to compete with uh, online sales. It is a much, I'm not going to say easy, but it's not as difficult to make a book and publish it and find an audience for it as it was four years ago, five years ago, six years ago. So I would say that now there is an opportunity for people to publish books independently and not have to sell an organ or not eat. You can actually make books that are reasonably priced with great quality that are at uh, a high level and for an audience that's very niche So that is, the, from my perspective, that's been the big development now is people, there's an opportunity for publishers to go as niche as they want. The more niche, the better. Even five, 10 years ago, people 
had this idea that you have to be broad and you have to appeal to the lowest common denominator. And I was never interested in that. So uh, I'm not the I'm, I'm not the most objective uh, person in that on that subject. But uh, I find that the more niche you are, the more you can speak to your particular audience. Less competitors, maybe. Also. Oh, of course, less competitors. Mm. And mm. also, my customers are buying books from Ivan, this guy that they know. Maybe they've sent me an email. Maybe I've sent them an email. Maybe they have seen me give a talk. Maybe they've, they've heard this podcast. This is a very valid and strong way to make books that are deep, rich, and stand the test of time. So what I say to people is don't try and make a book that is going to sell quickly uh, or be a very easy thing. Make something that will have value 5, 10, 15 years from now, potentially, because it's those long sellers that people will remember and will be part of who you are, uh, part of your identity. And a book, I think, is, has magic power, definitely. A, a book is, can travel time, can travel continents, and it can communicate such emotion and experience. So the more we have people making books that are very idiosyncratic, more niche, uh, the better. So I embrace all this e-commerce and all this sophisticated logistics because it's capacitating a new type of business. I want to speak about Japanese uh, photography. Um, um, I think it's not uh, it's not always uh, simple to, to to speak about Japanese photography. So, um, can you try to explain uh, what uh, for you is really specific uh, to Japanese uh, photography or Japanese photography books? Uh, you can compare to to America, for instance, or for, to France. And and do you see specific uh, elements uh, to, uh, to understand uh, the Japanese photography uh, industry? Mm. The, the industry. Yeah, both like the yeah. Mm. There are a lot of things. So uh, with this question, it's really like uh, you what you think. It's is yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, the two are connected. The photography industry in Japan is well photography industry that is related to the sale and collection of prints is compared to other countries almost non-existent or at best small and the uh, publishing industry is uh, much more rich so there are many many small publishers and also even larger publishing houses are publishing a lot of photography and also um, popular magazines, as we call them, uh, culture, lifestyle and culture magazines. They publish a lot of uh, contemporary uh, photography. There's a lot, a lot of interest and f an appetite for the consumption of photography in Japan, no doubt, uh, of all kinds, nature photography, erotic photography, fine art, um, uh uh, sports um, on on so uh, nature I don't know if I, I or or wildlife animal on so many different levels there's a very sophisticated audience uh, for photography and its consumption but its consumption people don't necessarily want to buy a print to put on a frame and put on their wall so the way in which people engage with photography the culture of photography here is quite different from uh, how it's thought of in other parts uh, of the world. Why do you think? That is a good question. Mm. The, the, uh, there, there are many ways to answer that question. There are many, many answers. For example, putting a print in a frame on a wall, this kind of salon approach, was something that was done in Japan in the pre-war period. Uh, but the salon approach to photography after the war really didn't uh, continue, although it does exist. Uh, 
And people don't really entertain at home in Japan. So you wouldn't have、uh, a guest to your house and have art on the wall for people to、uh, enjoy. If that would, it's, it's a little more formalistic than that, how entertaining people happen s、uh, in Japan. So, how you would enjoy the photography, how, how people enjoy photography here is, is、uh, quite. Different.、Uh, and I think that is the first basis. And photography is something that you consume here. And it's very kind of like fast and very,、uh, which is not to say that it's cheap. It's, it's to say that it, it's just like with literature or anything other, it's one type of one manifestation of media. And that is. Uh, that's, that's a big difference. Yeah, that's a, I would say that's one of the biggest、uh, differences. And also, photography isn't something that I'm speaking in broad terms that you appreciate in isolation. As media, it is appreciated in re- its relationship to other things. So, its relationship to other images, its relationship to the story that it appears with. Or it's in relationship to the community that it was made for. So it's a photography circle or a photography group, or it's part of a discourse. So a photographer is responding to an existing discourse in a magazine. And so their work is meant for publication because it's trying to engage with a particular uh, uh, discourse uh, at that moment. So that's very different from a photographer making work to sell to people because from the outset there's no expectation that it's going to sell. <laughs>、uh, the, the way in which people are reaching out to or you, looking to engage with photography happens in,、uh, in ways that are、uh, much different from how the industry has developed. Uh, and been professionalized in America or in France with curator, curators and、uh, agencies and、um, editioning and, and galleries and、uh, the fine art, the fine art approach to photography. That is a whole world and culture that has generated, has, has developed over generations in the West, but that has not really. Have, doesn't have a place、uh, in Japan. And the, the last time you, we, we spoke about uh, Japanese uh, photography, you told me also about the, the, the story, like, the, like uh, in, uh, in the Western、uh, world, fine, in Western photography,、uh, we are really speaking about the, what is the story in this、uh, picture. And you, you told me, like, In Japan, it's, we are not thinking the same, so I think it can be in, interesting if you can.、Uh, right. In comparison, about that. In comparison to、uh, what I see、uh, happening quite often in the Western world of portfolio reviews, competitions,、uh, photo book publications,、uh, lectures, research,、uh, there's a lot of Conceptualizing of photography as a vehicle for a story. And that means that it's telling the story of the subject in the photo- photograph, it's telling the, f- the story of the photographer, it's telling the story of a people, it's telling the story of a nation. It's always this thing about a story. It's always about a story. There's some narrative. At, but photography isn't just. A story vehicle. Yes, that's one way that photography can be, but that is not the only way that photography can function. And I see that the Westerners are quite polarized in their approach. And a story has a beginning, it has an end, it has development, it has tension, character, plot. All these are elements that are. Uh, modulating your experience of the photography. And I find it to be extremely Western specific. And、uh, photography from Japan, on the other hand, 
story, sometimes there is no story. It's just, it's a mood or an experience or it's the haze in the air. And uh, sometimes I see a lot of curators or uh, uh, people who are interested in Japanese photography uh, very eager to apply a story to the work. Like Fukase Masahisa was going through a very troubling divorce and he was very, very sad and he went to Hokkaido and that's where this symbol found shape in the form of a raven and it's yes that is not untrue but that is not the only filter that's not the only approach that's not the only way to think about photography and especially with japanese photography it can be extremely conceptual something that looks very uh, still life can be extremely conceptual it, the photography can also be uh, science fiction or time travel or it can uh, collapse multiple ideas at the same time or photography in Japan could be an artifact or a document or a false document all of these are different approaches to how a, photogra a photograph is conceived yes yeah, so, uh, since I'm uh, living in uh, Japan I've I'm really I'm, I'm I try really to not um to not think too much as a French when I'm when I see uh, Japanese uh, images or photography, and I think it's really interesting to 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 discover more another country through the photography or for his images because we can uh, think about your own uh, production like and but it's really an exercise to try to to step back and to so so it's really it's really interesting and i think it takes time to really see fin, what you sell fin, uh, about the story uh, but like uh, uh, we are really used to think in a certain way with a filter and when we when we speak and when we see uh, f Japanese photography or i think photography from um, a country far from a uh, western world uh, I think we really need to to do this exercise because if we don't do that, we will lose uh, ninety percent of the of the of the meaning because we will f we will try to to find what we want to find and maybe we will be uh, disappointed or we won't understand. So I think it's really. I'm, I'm so glad to hear you say that because I think that not just Japanese photography, but photography in general, or, or any art in general, is a process of self-discovery. So the more you engage with something, the more you're learning about yourself. And I feel that Japanese photography can be that place for a Western audience or a non-Japanese audience to discover their own ideas, pre-established ideas about photography. In other words, the more we can understand the work of a different culture, the more we can see our conventions, what we thought was an absolute truth about the world is actually culturally specific. So what we think is one way of looking at photography is actually a French way of looking at photography that's specific to me as a person in, in this particular time period. And that is the potential of Japanese photography for the West. It gives the West an opportunity to re-examine their core ideas and core beliefs of what is photography. And that is how I want to approach the books that I make and how I want to approach my relationship as a, I guess, ambassador for Japanese photography to say to non-Japanese people come to this work and appreciate it on its own terms. And that is the opportunity for growth and surprise and change. So one thing, uh, people in the West have really embraced the photo book as this uh, place for uh, to, to think about and especially the, the Japanese photo book, 
that, oh, this amazing, these masterpieces. And then over time, it's become clear that the understanding of the photo book from Japan is uh, convenient for a Western audience because it fits the model of the pre-existing model of an artist working in isolation, creating art from zero and putting it out in the world. And that is not inaccurate, but that's only one way. And now that I've made the magazine book, uh, which involves a lot of cross-pollination, a lot of photographers working in collaboration, for example, or photographers working with writers or writers uh, be influencing the photography, uh, it be, it's very clear that photography that eventually got edited into a photo book didn't begin as a photographer working in a vacuum. It was very much the byproduct of a lot of influences working together that manifested as a body of work that then later became a photo book. So uh, that seeing how the West has latched on to the Japanese photo book, it also it, it is like, oh, yes, all right. Um, it's important for Westerners to think of photographers as isolated creators. But in reality, that's not how it happens. Yeah. And my uh, last uh, question is, uh, do you have advice for photographers or for publisher? Ah, great question. For a photographer, I would say that uh, 100% you have to believe in your work and you have to go for it a thousand percent. Don't hold back. Go, go, go deep, 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 deep. Make mistakes. Put it out there. Put it out there. Don't wait. Publish. Don't wait. Put it to a magazine. Just go, 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 go. And don't stop. You're going to fail more times than you succeed, but don't give up. Just keep working hard and making good work. And if you keep making good work, the audience will come or whatever you're seeking will come. Just enjoy the process. Uh, yeah. And for publishers, I would say that this is a new world it is extremely intimidating and frightening to put so much money and effort into a project that you don't know is going to make it. But there are tools now to take the scary part out of the publishing. And there are ways to make a book that finds its audience. And I encourage people who never thought about publishing before to be their own independent publishers This is the time for niche publishing. We need publishers who are making books on uh, African-American cookbooks, or we need uh, a niche publisher who's going to make uh, books that are devoted to uh, photographers from Marseille, or making books that are about, uh, um, I don't know, uh, anything that is part of an identity that is important to a people, that is an audience. And I think publishing can be a way of self-discovery. And I encourage people to think of it not as an industry, but as a very personal process of defining who you are in the world. Thank you. I think we, we have covered a lot of subjects, a lot of <laughs> uh, topics. So thank you a lot for your time. For oh, your thank you advice for uh, like yeah for all your insights uh thank you and i think uh, people can find all the information i will i will uh, i will write the, uh, the the put the link of your website of your instagram so thank you oh. ivan thank you maria thank you it was a <laughs> pleasure to speak to you bye okay bye bye thank you for listening to daily voile la photo To make the podcast known to more people, I invite you to write a comment and give five stars on Apple Podcast. If you want to share your comments with me, you can follow me on social media, on Instagram, LinkedIn, and Facebook. See you next time.